Hello and welcome to a bonus discussion from MinMax. My name is Ben Hansen. Thank you for being here. MinMax is a place about games, friends, and getting better. And we're joined by Brian Vohr. Hello, everyone. Um, Nintendo super fan Brian Vohr. That's right. I love Nintendo stuff. Uh, I guess as much as the next guy. And the, um, and the next guy is Charles McGregor, <laughs> developer of HyperDot. Oh my goodness, this is me. Welcome. I also like Nintendo stuff, as evidenced by this shirt. And You'll have to sit up a little the, bit. Not that. Don't look at that. Okay. The, the Nintendo 64 poster. There you go. Smart, smart. Uh, yeah. Charles, developer of HyperDot. It'll be nice to have your developer perspective, your Nintendo love. And Brian, I'm curious to have your perspective because, I mean, you were a Game Informer. You probably started around the same time that Reggie started. Like, when did you start a Game Informer? Oh Lord! <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I, per, you know, probably or I think before Reggie, because wow. I was there for eleven years, and then, uh, and I've been gone from there for quite some time. So uh, I wish I had that at the ready for you, but I will have it shortly. <laughs> but still, a longer <laughs> run in the game industry than Reggie Fizeme. So we're we're interested in having your full perspective. <laughs> Please try and cast yeah. your mind back to those early days. Uh, this is a discussion uh, about. Reggie fils new book, his business memoir, as he likes to put it, called Disrupting the Game. I know this is a stupid thing, but full spoilers for Reggie's book and Reggie's life, everybody. Um, I think the book is worth reading, and so we're not going to go through every detail here, but we're going to have a wide range of conversation about every aspect of this book. And if you enjoy this type of content, you can help support it directly. The easy, the easy way out is by subscribing to our YouTube channel. That's... That's free as hell. Any help sharing the video, that's free as hell. We appreciate it. Earning our appreciation is free as hell. Uh, but you can also unlock the podcast version of this discussion, The Deepest Dives, Compete in Trivia Tower. There's a bunch of other benefits if you actually go to patreon.com slash minmax with two N's and support us at the $5 tier. Specifically, that's where you get the podcast version of all these wonderful YouTube videos. So just follow that link that's in the description below. We'd appreciate it. All right, disrupting the game. Um, I read it. Brian read it. And then, Charles, you had the audiobook. Do I have that right? I, or both of you guys I audiobooked audio booked it. This is my first audiobook. Congratulations. So, yeah. Way to go. This is, this is my 400th audiobook. <laughs> oh, okay, two it's, audiobooks. It's my my 95% way of reading everything. Nice. <laughs> nice. It, how was it? How did Reggie do? How did he hold up over the, the whole recording here? It felt like I was uh, watching a direct for eight hours. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> greatest fantasy. Yeah, I yeah. was like, wow. Uh, to full full disclosure here, I'm already like before the book, I was already a big Reggie fan. Like if if that well, I guess that wasn't really all that obvious. But uh <laughs> yeah, I really have respected Reggie for a lot of huh. things. Uh there's not like there's not a lot of uh black people that I can like point to in the industry and be like, Oh yeah, there's that person. Um especially back um when I was like, I first learned of Reggie, right. there were definitely not as many black people uh, in the industry. And like, so like me and my brother in particular are, have, are like really big fans of Reggie. Oh, that's so. funny. That's very cool. Uh, Brian, what did you think about the book overall, man? Yeah, I kind of agreed his cadence was a little bit press conference-y, but you get a little bit of a, what's, what's nice about the audio book too, is that you get kind of a bonus one hour kind of almost like a podcast with Jeff Jeff Keeley at the yeah. end. And you get to hear Reggie's like real voice. Yeah. It's kind of like when <laughs> Gilbert Godfrey is, you know, <laughs> you hear his real voice. You're like, ah, when he's and not like, just oh. doing like the, I'm a businessman presenting, you know, just more casual talk is, is kind of interesting. That's really interesting because yeah. Um, I, I read the book, I bought the book and read it. And then uh, Charles is a real sweetheart. And he sent me over that hour long bonus thing with Keeley. So that's all I heard. And if that's his oh. casual voice, my God, I can't imagine what the rest of that book is. I don't know. It's Highly still, casual. It's still yeah. you know, business, business stilted. But I really did enjoy that discussion with Ke- Keeley. Like, it, it's worth getting the audio book for that. Because I think some of the headlines that came out of that is like, oh, believe it or not, they talk about Mother 3. It's like, oh, that's great. Other people in his entire you know press run talking to journalists about this book, everyone's been asking about Mother 3. But I think the real meat and potatoes of that bonus stuff... Uh, it seems like a weird place to jump right in. But the real meat and potatoes is just like them kind of unpacking the relationship. And strangely enough, it wasn't even the Reggie uh, Keeley stuff that was fascinating. It was 
Reggie kind of interrogating and asking about the relationship between Keeley and Alada. Like that's the stuff mm-hmm. that I felt like really popped for me. Even just talking about yeah. Keeley was talking about being at TGS uh, before the Wii launched and how Awada invited him to go out for drinks. Mm-hmm. And Reggie was like stunned by that. Like what? That seems wild. And even though Reggie says that, you know, Awada was a dear friend. He's like, I got drinks with Awada less than five times, five times yeah. throughout yeah. our entire lives. Like it's pretty rare that he will actually take you out for drinks. He has to feel really comfortable to do that. So it's really stunning just to unpack that relationship. And it's one of those things of like, oh, I respect Keeley. Uh, but now, especially with them just really lavishing praise on him producing the segments with the Muppets and the Mega 64 stuff, it's like, oh, believe it or not, Keeley's worthy of more attention and respect than even we paid in the game industry, I think. Yeah, I think that was kind of a surprise that it was because it's like, oh, I guess that's just been a big secret this whole time. Like, I wonder how much other kind of behind the scenes, because usually you think of Jeff Keeley as like, I'm out front and center. I'm the big presenter of everything. And to know he kind of did some of this. On the back end, I also really liked his his little story of doing the VO with Iwata, yeah, uh, shortly before his passing, and how kind of special that was. Yeah, yeah, for the for the Muppet VO, um, and just yeah, I mean, oh, can you imagine? I would I would never stop crying if I had that actual memory that Keeley does of just seeing Miyamoto and Iwata like joking around recording dialogue for puppets. I mean, months before Iwata passes away, like, oh God, this is devastating. Yeah. Man. Yeah, and like also, I guess spoiler. That's not really a spoiler. It's the first thing that happens in the book. But like to start out with that, yeah, you know, was like a huge gut punch. I was like, oh, oh man, um, and like yeah, it's it's definitely like all, both of those uh, memories were were uh, interesting because then yeah, you, then you start thinking about like when was when did you hear uh, about it? Like what happened around around then? And like man, yeah, yeah, I remember. Uh, uh, whole thing i remember i was on a date when Awada passed away and it was like an earliest date and it was one of those like Whew, hey this is a weird thing to share but i just went to the bathroom and checked my phone and it turns out that like this big figure in the industry died and i feel like i feel like i need to unpack this with somebody even though i know you don't really care about this person you don't know <laughs> so i don't know it stands out to me um but we should we should talk about this book in general a little oh, bit yes. uh the whole disrupting the game uh like yeah brian overall high level review what do you think about this thing well, I think it's kind of, well, I think with every bio, I think it's rough in the beginning when you're like, oh yeah, you were a kid and then you got older, you know? And then it's like, it was, I was very much worried, especially in his earlier career, or at least coming out of college, that it was going to be all very, very much business booky and like, right. here's strategies you can use to win and succeed in life. And, um, which it, it does a fair amount of that, but it I, is that it, it is very much a lot more fun and interesting once he gets into Nintendo for the first time and you get all the back behind the scenes on like, Oh, we were so nervous about this press conference. And this is what it was like when I, you know, had to push back on Iwata and a lot of the establishment. Um, I think, yeah, it just gets better the farther in you get with it. Yeah. Uh, it's like, um... you really had to underscore in that first chapter. Like, obviously that's, we got to have something big in the beginning to like hook the people and keep mm-hmm. them reading. Uh, but I think we get it that he is friends with Awada. Like he's no. like he doesn't say the word Awada without friend somewhere in the vicinity <laughs> uh, for the whole book. Yeah, it, it's very sweet. Um, yeah, it's a it's a shorter book than I expected. Like under two hundred pages was it like one seventy five or was it around two hundred? I forget exactly. It might have been. I think it was just shy of two hundred. Um. And so, yeah, a little over half is Nintendo stuff. So it's still a fair amount of him mm-hmm. kind of walking mm-hmm. through his overall uh, business run at Procter & Gamble and all that fun stuff. Um, I, I enjoyed reading it. I think I was expecting it to be a little bit more in-depth. It still felt pretty guarded, but just even having these glimpses inside Nintendo are mm-hmm. a godsend. I, I feel like it's great to have this looking through the keyhole. It's just a couple of key moments, but like, man... It, Look, he can do whatever he wants, but I feel like this book could have been a thousand pages and it would have been just fine. You know, like I just um, <laughs> I just read this book called Disney War, uh, which is all about like the the run of Eisner at Disney. And that book's like, yeah, a thousand pages, just like super specific details about this span of time at Disney getting into all this drama. So to go from that to this and it's just kind of pretty sure. breezy, like 
Miyamoto was very smart. Iwata was very smart and sweet. Moving on, you know, it's like, no, there's so <laughs> yeah. much more. You know so much more. And I'm not looking for yeah. dirt, but I just feel like there's so many incredible details for history that should get out there. But uh, sorry, Charles, what did you think overall? Yeah, um, I I liked, I really liked it. Um, I think that my expectations were different going in. And I think that that was the thing that I had to really like check myself uh, halfway through, like when it started doing like the business stuff. Yeah. Because technically I think that I'm like part of the demographic for this, where it's like um, if you're interested in like entrepreneurship uh, or like being a leader, like this is probably the book that that is the target demographic. Yeah. uh, Because like I would say, 70% 70% of this book is uh, talking about that stuff. Um, and it's less so about uh, talking about like Reggie doing things in Nintendo and like explicitly just doing things in Nintendo and like all the off stories and stuff, because it's always framed in uh, uh, like, how does this help you from like a leader standpoint uh, and thing? And they're yeah. always like the, the, so what's uh, things, which, I actually really liked. Um, yeah, so it, structurally, it's kind of a funky thing where he'll tell a little mm-hmm. story, then he'll have a little blow-out box that says, so what? It's like, here's the takeaway. You gotta stand your ground in business. It is, it's it's not going to bore you with the amount of business talk in there, but it is mm-hmm. just a nice reminder of like, oh, that's right, business people. Like, he yeah. loves <laughs> he loves calling himself a disruptor, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And like, even earlier on, I feel like there's kind of those moments of, oh, okay, but Reggie makes a little more sense now where early on he was talking about how he was gunning for a career in international banking. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, that, that is the type of guy that Reggie is. Like that was his highest aspiration was like, oh, international banking. I'll do great there. And I mean, it's amazing to see just how passionate he is in that early half of the book about business outside of Nintendo. I mean, he is, yeah. seems like he's just as passionate about nailing the marketing campaign for Crisco as he is about debating the price of the 3ds and stuff like yeah. that, you know, it's like okay, he's there's a lot of super specific stuff. Getting into the details of Pizza Hut and shutting down the Red Roof Pizza Hut because it costs too much to actually have the real estate to build out these restaurants where people would go and sit, which is my mm-hmm. ideal mm-hmm. Pizza Hut experience. But instead, we want people just to pick up and go because it's so much cheaper. And so, like those types of details were really interesting, um, and I think shed a little more light into where he's coming from. Whereas I think everybody else sees him as, well, you know, he's the guy on stage and he likes talking about Mario and mm-hmm, talking to mm-hmm. Keeley, the end, you know, it's like, he's just, yeah. he's just a businessman, everybody. Yeah. I gotta say that I didn't expect to hear the full reasoning of why my favorite, like childhood pizza hut sit down experience barely exists anymore. <laughs> right. like, oh, that's why I, I should have known, I guess, but Reggie, I just want it back. <laughs> give I, us the Bigfoot I pizza back this, as well. The strange, like, strangely fancy Pizza Hut Tiffany lights and the <laughs> the red plastic cups and the personal pan pizzas. I there's want, there's one those. left in uh, Minneapolis, Brian. I forget where it is, but I've been trying oh. to to rally a friend to go there for years. I can't do it. But maybe you're the person who I can finally motivate to get out of the house and go to a, an actual sit down pizza hut. Yeah. If I'm out of town, I like see a sit down pizza hut. I'm like, Oh, against the window. <laughs> what? Colleen's like, come on. You, you mention it every time we see one, it just keeps driving. It's not going to taste so, the same. Okay. We swear. Um, yeah, there's some stuff in that, uh, you know, kind of the outside of Nintendo business stuff where I think overall this entire book, it's a little, it's pretty glossy. It's uh, there's some things where it's like, I, I raise an eyebrow every once in a while, like, you know, when he, he was working at Guinness and he tells a story about how he was yelled at at Guinness for being too positive and believing in people too much. We're like, what? <laughs> Look, yeah. I don't understand the business world. I'm sure, I'm sure that's big picture true, but just like telling that story, it's like, this feels like absurdity that I do. Like, and then I was called into my boss's office and he said, stop being so positive, Reggie. Come on. It's like, what, what is stop this? Stop trying thing? to figure out the problems in the business and making them better. Right. <laughs> like, You're too yeah. good and I can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like my biggest critique of the, the book is that like, uh, there weren't a lot of, um, reflections on mistakes um, um, and the mistakes that were there were framed in a way that were like, uh, 
well, I did everything I could, but it just didn't work out kind of thing. Not right. necessarily like a, oh, I just like I made a blunder or I screwed up. Yeah, he uh, says his he says his biggest failure was the launch price of the 3DS, which yeah. he wanted to be 199. It launched at 250 because it seemed like Awada and the team in Japan, NCL, as they label it, um, wouldn't budge. And so for that to be his biggest failure, it's like, I don't know, there's got to be something more personal than just I wanted to make things affordable and Awada and the team didn't. The end. Like, sure. you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and like, he's, oh, sorry. Obviously, the Wii U was a was a big mistake. He didn't call it out as his biggest failure like that. But it feels like that's more a much more like prolonged uh, blunder. But I guess maybe he felt the price battle was more of a kind of a personal mistake versus mm-hmm. Wii U. They're like, you know, it was kind of more of a group, a fail- group kind of failure. Thing, yeah, <laughs> yeah there, there are certain things that you know you can really read into um, because uh, they're. They're still a little, you know, breezy, but there's certain things where it's like, okay, Iwata had a meeting with him once talking about the importance of like, hey, you really need to listen to your team. It's like, is this just random Iwata advice or is this maybe a, a weakness of Reggie that he was trying to improve? Like there's some of those things where it's kind of a shade of gray. Um, yeah. Or there's there's one little detail as well that I really enjoyed where he kind of broke down the the seat of power within Nintendo truly and how it's within NCL. There's this management committee, and that he really wanted to be put on this management committee by Iwata, and Iwata never put Reggie on this management committee. But it was like so the 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 core. I imagine it's the the round table right at Nintendo. So it's Iwata Miyamoto, at least it was back in the day. Uh, the CFO, and then like the sales lead in Japan, and then the R and D lead in Japan. And apparently after Wada's death, they reshuffled things and eventually got on some board that I think was maybe mm-hmm. a reimagining of this. But there's little glimpses of like, oh, it feels like there's a lot of potential discussion and I don't know if you want to say drama or just like kind of weaknesses of Reggie that could be there in some way, but it's not really explored in a big way. But I mean, I get it. I mean, Brian, if you wrote your autobiography, do you think you'd really spend that much time being like, I blew it here and I blew it there? <laughs> <laughs> the one... The one mistake I think he fully cops to, uh, I think, is the that ad buy for was it was it Crisco kind of late in his P and G right career mm-hmm. right where he's like oh yeah it was bad timing I pushed it up and it was like messed with their fiscal you know result like spending and mm-hmm. he's like I was a dead man walking after that and I was like okay yeah. it's kind of refreshing to hear like at least young Reggie had one had mistake. mistake yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I with memoirs it's tough because <clears throat> you know with the companies he worked for, he's got to like run that through lawyers to be like, okay, I, I make sure right. like, no one's going to sue me from this company, and then I got to make sure no one from my personal life sues me from this company. So a lot of memoirs skip, like, oh, my first wife only only mentioned as like it was tough when I went through that divorce. Yes, exactly. Just, like, That's a great example. Not even no acknowledgement yeah. of like meeting them or whatever. Um, but yeah, memoirs, memoirs are tricky. Yeah. And very rarely do you get something as like long and unvarnished. I, in the last year or so, I read Keith Richards autobiography mm. and that's just shocking, but like how much detail he goes into everything and, uh, you know, it's not split up into several books. It's just like one fat brick. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I think the trickiest part about this memoir is what we kind of mentioned as far as like, I either want a full on like memoir style memoir or give me a business book. Mm-hmm. Like the mixture of the two is kind of jarring when you jump to those pull out boxes and you're like, oh, a human story. Oh, wait, no, it's always tied to business. Even mm-hmm. like his his really interesting like 9-11 story where he's yeah. like, hey, yeah. we went down all the executives. You're the top man here. Like, help us clear the building. And like, hey, that's kind of exciting. And, you know, how har- harrowing that must have been. Totally. And he's like, managed to get that spot on the train, like, finally get out of town, which must have been just like so hard. Yeah. And just right, like right. the human toll. And then in the end, he's just like, that's right, Reggie. You're the best businessman in the world. You, <laughs> you, <laughs> you got it done. You know, like he even <laughs> ties the end on that with just some kind of like management, like mastery. It's like. Just let that human story speak for itself. Management mm-hmm. tip. When in 9-11, here's what you it's like, what is this? No, I, I hear you. There's, it's interesting. On um, I, I listened to every podcast interview that he did to promote this book. 
and uh, Brian Shea over at Game Informer had an interview with him on his All Things Nintendo podcast. But in that, um, Shea had a detail that I don't think Reggie had shared anywhere else, where apparently this wasn't Reggie's first idea for a book. Mm. Um, apparently he originally pitched a book that was about the things you can learn from video games, like playing Monster Hunter teaches you teamwork and all those types oh. of things. Um, and then I guess the publisher was like, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> like, write the memoir. <laughs> You're ready. <laughs> so I think that's a little bit telling that it's like it wasn't, he, he wasn't dying to, like, get his story down. It took a little bit of nudging, I feel like, mm-hmm. you know, from the publisher to be like, hey, how about you do the thing that people would be interested in? So maybe, I think the business speak might even be a way of, if you want to be really cynical about it, about kind of cutting down the amount of details that he really needs to go into in the book. Because it's like, oh, I can I can wax poetic about business strategy instead of telling another story about what it's really like to be in a long frustrating meeting with Miyamoto, you know, that sure. type of thing. Yeah. I can see that. Um, here's a, here's a question for you. Mm. He, I like that he talks about, you know, being a big fan of Nintendo early on that he was all in on the super Nintendo. He owned what, like 80 games or some absurd amount of games yeah. for the super Nintendo link to the past was his favorite game of all time back in the day. And, um, he says something. I'm not a huge Super Mario World guy. I, I know that's sacrilegious. I beat it once, so get off my back, everybody. I didn't have a Super Nintendo growing up. Now, relax, Charles. I need you to relax. But in this book, and in almost every interview Reggie has done about this, he's mentioned that I beat Super Mario World with 99 lives. Is that specifically a sign of, like, prowess Being in that really game? Good. Yeah, what, is that relevant I mean, in a big way? It seems like a weird detail. You can farm one of Right. That's what right. I, yeah. Yeah. It's not necessary. Like if you, if you didn't farm one ups, it is kind of, it, I, I would something. say that is like, Oh wow. Nice. It's not a, okay. it's not a war. <laughs> you just beat Elden ring with at level one kind of thing. Right. Right. Um, but like, so yeah, what, you, it would be like a, Oh wow. Nice. Well done. Kind of thing. So, so worth mentioning, you think? Okay. Put a little perspective on it. Uh, yeah. I'm not one to normally tout oh, gamer brag boy. stuff. Oh boy, here we go. But I didn't have 80 games. I had Mario World to start, and it was probably my only game for a little while. And uh, I would 96 star a save file, and then I would go to the slot two and 96 star that, and then I would go to slot three and 96 star that. Jesus. And then eventually I was like, why don't I just delete one? (laughs) (laughs) So I was pretty obsessed with Super Mario World. For me, it wins the world versus Mario 3 debate. Sacrilegious. So I would say if Reggie wanted to brag, maybe talk about something like that. I mean, it doesn't seem to get crazier than that. Just like beating every Star World and opening up every path in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Learn how to brag, Reggie. Come on, man. Oh, my goodness. Come on. Um, I, I like. Is it a truth? Also, before we go too far, yeah. that link to the past you can only watch the credits once. Oh right, yeah. He mentions was, that. Like his son yeah. ruined his safe. Ruined like, that right. ending. Right. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know if that's true. I guess it is, but like, wouldn't you be able to because his son, uh, like, kept pace with him? Wouldn't you be able to go onto his son's save? And continue going. I don't know the logistics of how all that worked. So <laughs> I <laughs> foggy to at best. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have been in this uh, situation where I was the little brother uh, and I screwed up my brother's save. Ooh, um, that's rough. So, you know, I, I can feel for Reggie in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ben, would you, would you, would you grant this, this action clemency or what, what is the, Oh, the gaming guys, sin thing that we yeah, had on new show plus. <laughs> um, I think that's forgiven. I think that's forgiven. It's your kid. You know, they're not doing it maliciously. You got it. You got to give him a pass. I think it's probably one of 3000 <laughs> like things that the child has done. <laughs> yes. Throughout yes. his life at that point. <laughs> it was very infuriating. Um, yeah, I like that early on stuff. You know, it, it, it was, it was breezy. Um, just him talking about his upbringing and, his family's history in Haiti, I thought was really interesting. How his mm, grandpa mm-hmm. was high up in the military in Haiti and he had pictures with Dwight Eisenhower and stuff. It's like, wow, that's yeah. such a weird detail, but I love it. He like spoke at the UN at the risk of being banned, like not ever being able yeah, to enter exactly. Haiti again. And 
they were like, okay, well, we said we would do it, and, and we did. We and, did uh, it. and he was just like not able to go back to his home country ever again, and then never saw mm-hmm. his wife again. Yeah, because she was stuck there. They wouldn't let her leave. Yeah, yeah, which is like yeah, heartbreaking. And um, I'm uh, when I like first heard because I knew that uh, uh, Reggie has talked about like him having like a a, a rougher up uh, upbringing. Yeah, uh, but like when he first said like. Yeah, and it was like a there was a stark difference um, in Hades or Haiti because like it was like, oh, we were yeah we had generals we had people like we were doing well, um, and then the stark contrast to, yeah uh, now there's you know blood on the stairs you should look up and then you don't look up right that entire sequence yeah was been there. it was brutal for sure um, yeah, yeah it's interesting he's talking about his dad. Uh, had a rough go because he was a light skinned black man and just getting bullied because of that and all that stuff. And it's like, okay, there's again, like with so many things in this book, it's like, okay, you're scr- scratching the surface. This could be an entire chapter, but we're getting two paragraphs and then we're kind of moving on. Um, it kind of in that way. And I know it's a completely different book, but I don't know if you all read a lot of asks, um, that book that came out earlier. I didn't read the, well. the book, but I read a lot of the columns and stuff. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. The, the book, uh, if you ever want to, borrow a trousers you can grab it from my place but um but it also is just shockingly breezy and that's more like a collection of bits of his essays you know mm-hmm. bits from a wada ass and just kind of a, a kind of piece together half memoir but i feel like both of these nintendo books they're, they're great i'm so happy that we have them but i think they both fall into that camp of like god i, I want to ask a thousand follow-up questions about each one of these little sections please <laughs> yeah. um but hey maybe you can score the big another big reggie interview maybe he's still giving them out maybe that might happen but maybe the only time they could schedule it was during my honeymoon but who can no! say we'll see we'll see how it goes we'll see how it goes we'll see how it goes so fingers crossed okay. um I mean, if, if, okay uh, I, I don't want to say anything, but, you know, if you wanted to get another person on there. <laughs> oh, interesting. Say. Interesting. OK, <laughs> good to know. Good to know. Nice. Um, hey, uh, the Nintendo era. It starts out uh, with him talking to the head of PR at Nintendo. Um, it's another one of those stories where it's like, wait, what are you talking about? Where he's talking to the head of PR at Nintendo. And uh, he's like, hey, you should know at Nintendo, um, we're like a Japanese company. We don't really believe in all the people stuff and like (laughs) encouraging employees to grow and then reggie says wow i disagree i have a completely different view on this i support people and it's like oh okay this seems like a very odd exchange i yeah i'm always so with those things where it's like oh yeah you're too positive or uh yeah we're really we're not really a people uh person i i feel like it is talking more about uh how it was just like it's very all right we've done we have done the business bye and like you should you should just like we're 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 done we're leaving we're no longer talking uh we respect each other but we're gone and i think that that is the thing that is like the thing that reggie uh is like really proud of and being like yeah i wanted to introduce that more into the uh, company and like do this more uh or like worry like yeah, I want to talk about uh, how uh, people are growing and stuff and like being like uh, supportive in that regard. And like, I think that that is the thing that is uh, trying to be said. But yeah, it definitely comes off as the person that is like, yeah, we're done and we don't want to talk anymore is coming off like, all right, this is the most cold exchange ever. We are right. transactionally talking. All right, bye. And then you leave. Right. Uh, right. Kind of thing. And, and parts of this book are, are were backed up an interesting way from uh, Kit and Krista who recently left Nintendo and they talked a bit about the book on their podcast and, and and they mentioned that Reggie was specifically really great about remembering everybody's name, which I'm always very impressed by. Uh, that like he would go around the office and he hadn't seen these people in maybe like eight months where he's like, hey, Kevin, how's the lake house? I mean, and they were just like, how is he doing this? This is some weird <laughs> business next level stuff. And they told this story too that was very cute about God, I forget what it was. Some fancy games industry event that Reggie flew to and they lost his luggage. So he didn't have a suit. So he showed up to this very fancy games event where everyone's all decked out in suit and tie and all that stuff. And he showed up like in jeans and a t-shirt. And they were just shocked that he seemed still 100% comfortable. 
Like, he knew it was a weird situation, didn't want to call it out, and still was just, like, glad-handing everybody and not, like, really pointing and laughing at himself. It was more just a matter of, like, nope, this is you know, the cards that were dealt me, and now I will ride this in a very confident way. It's like, <laughs> and he did it. I don't know how. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, the Reginator. I don't think I've ever seen him outside of a, a suit, really. Yeah, casual Reggie. Um, I, I thought it was interesting. It seemed like the the big thing, and I, I was glad that he touched on a little bit, is just the tension between Nintendo of America and NCL, between the Japanese mm-hmm. side of the studio and the American side of the studio. And he points out that, like, hey, despite Western markets making 75% of the profits, at times it is a struggle to, like, make our voices heard within a Japanese-led company. And I think this is common for a lot of Japanese publishers, just trying to bridge that gap to communicate to explain priorities explain like hey in the west it might not be perceived that way you know every time that nintendo has one of those moves everyone says what are you doing nintendo um it can be chalked up maybe to this idea of like well it's coming from a different culture in kyoto that we do not understand and i'm sure it makes sense there but just as it gets broadcast out to the wider world it's it's confusing um but yeah I, i'm yeah, glad that he I at least it was acknowledged interesting that. like his early thing where it was like when i was there uh, first starting up, uh, they wanted to release something called the Game Boy Micro. And I was like, what are you guys doing? And he's like, I didn't have, it was so far along that I couldn't, I couldn't yeah, stop, couldn't it. stop uh, it. He's like, what are you guys doing? Everyone no. wants big screens. Right, <laughs> yeah. you're right. You're making a tiny screen. And that's you like, can't even touch, you can't even, you know, handle this that, thing all with that normal yeah. hands. And now we're all charmed <laughs> and are nostalgic with the Game Boy Micro. But yeah, imagine that where it's like, okay, right when he came in, it was right before the kind of the, the ramp up to the launch of the DS. If it's like all in on messaging about the DS, we're DS. moving ahead. And then what is it a year later? It's like, yeah, but then also this Game Boy Micro is like, no, oh, yeah, what way. are you doing? <laughs> yeah. And he says like, that's I remember kind of that being so weird because it, it was, was like, confusing. Oh yeah, you can change the face plates and stuff. And I was like, huh, that's cool. But I, the DS though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but he said, he chalks it up to like, that's a problem with Nintendo just being siloed, like all mm-hmm. these different, pillars of development are just siloed off and suddenly the R&D team or whoever that's coming from is suddenly popping over like, ta-da, a Game Boy mi- Micro. And everyone's like, Wait, what are you doing? We are trying <laughs> to move ahead in one direction here. So trying, and I'm sure it's a hell of a struggle to unify and get those silos talking so they, they can kind of align their priorities more is an interesting aspect of the book. Mm-hmm. And one thing I want to mention, want you to do if, if you manage to work out the timing on yeah. this Reggie interview, can you ask him, what kind of games was he planning for VH1.com that were scuttled yes! by 9-11? Oh. Like, like, what was his big plan to save VH1.com was to be like, let's put games on there. Oh, and I'm yeah. like, do you want to have like behind the music themed games or like, oh, I love that. What was idea. it going to be? Yes, that's a, that's a great <laughs> question because yeah, he, he points out that like he was working with the founders of Vicarious Visions right. super early on, I think. Were they even that studio yet? Um, and uh, they were contracting yeah. with them in New York to make these VH1 games. Hang on. I'll write this down, Brian. Um, what you, were they you. going to be? Um, and then that, it's such an interesting detail. And I love that. It kind of shed some light into like, oh, that's how Mario Kart Live Home Circuit happened. From those founders who, when they left Vicarious Visions, their new studio, I forget the name of the new studio, but they're the ones that got that contract to make the Mario Kart live. And so it's like, okay, it goes way back. Maybe Reggie had a hand in that um, in the early development. But I was waiting for that to kind of pay off because like, oh, it's interesting that they go out of their way to set up like the founders, the brothers behind mm-hmm. Vicarious Visions. And then it's just kind of, mm-hmm. oh, nope. Maybe it was a section that was cut or some callback that was cut later on or something. But I was waiting for the like, and then at the launch of the Wii U, who else came and ported Call of Duty but Vicarious Visions? Like something like that, <laughs> yeah. you know, but that's all right. Uh, let's see. They talk about the the launch of the Wii era. It's really fascinating to talk about Awada um, and him kind of sharing uh, books and how the Innovator's Dilemma and the Blue a- Blue Ocean Strategy were two big books in that era that helped define the what they were doing with that vision of just trying to reach a player base that was not typically playing games. Um, one of my favorite, I know this is juvenile, but one of my favorite parts of the book is when he talks about how when NCL revealed the name of the Wii for the first time to internal uh, Nintendo of America. It's like, hey, we're, we want to call this thing the Wii. And he's like, well, that's a challenge because that can be made fun of very easily. And then he puts in parentheses, Wii Wii. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, I see. It didn't, it didn't come off 
uh, uh, that way in the audiobook because he just said we again. Yeah. <laughs> just, oh, like, really? His, he's like pronounced yeah. we, <laughs> or yeah. you know, it or was just we, like we. And that, oh, that, was, that, was, that was about that's it. Really, it's really it's beautiful in print having the parentheses we weaved. I see. <laughs> Thank you for now telling us how we should have made fun of the we even more. But mm. it is stunning that they called it that. It is an amazing yep. call. Um, and I think yeah, it's in that first chapter, isn't it? Or is it just the podcast? I forget. Um, where he talks about uh, the marketing for the Wii and it's the two Japanese businessmen arriving oh, at the, the home. Chapter. That's the first chapter. Yeah. Arriving at the home, like, hey, we want to play. Um, play. Yeah. Oh, uh, and how apparently it was like time. weeks before they launched that, that Awada's like, I don't think so. Um, I think you should pull that campaign because it's too informal. The idea of these businessmen coming to the house and then like having a good time with the family it doesn't doesn't sit right um yeah the japanese businessmen would never be that informal <laughs> right it's like what a frustrating thing but he was so confident in that marketing campaign uh i mean that's that's the thing is like you know when he brought was brought on to nintendo he was uh on top of sales and marketing right and so right. i think so much of this book is from that perspective about framing right, things yeah. you got to get the right trailers got to message things correctly so it's just fascinating that he was like all in in a very mm-hmm. don draper like way of like this is your campaign. It's a great campaign. <laughs> Let them knock on the door and say we want to play. Yeah, he he lobbied for a final approval on on all like yes. ad, co- yeah. ad campaigns in NOA, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the book, he was talking about how you know he made sure that uh, he when he relinquished all that stuff, he re- uh, still maintained the I will get the final approval on right uh, ads and things. Do not burn me on this, everybody. Um, <laughs> and then uh, another one of the, the biggest debates uh, with NCL in the book uh, was about Wii Sports and whether or not to, to pack in that pack game. In. He was really pushing for them to pack it in. And he said that Miyamoto was pissed, more or less, and said, Reggie, we do not give away our software. <laughs> And he, like, I love this perspective from Miyamoto where I guess he's come from the angle of, like, you don't understand how hard we all had to work on that. You don't understand the challenges of game development. You're a sales guy. This is brutal. We cannot just give it away. Um, and this big debate back and forth about what to do, whether they could possibly do that. And they tried showing him what eventually became We Play and right. being like, we're also working on this. Maybe this could be the pack-in game. And it's it's amazing that Reggie didn't take that uh, consolation prize and instead he's like no 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 Wii Sports is the only thing that can really bring this to the oh, masses okay. we need it yeah. and it's it's amazing foresight on his part uh, although yeah, then, I mean, he, it, then it, they bundled Wii Play with the Wii Remote and then that sold bananas yeah yeah true. both of those key ideas uh, he can he's, he takes credit for which they were like the biggest hits possible like <laughs> yeah. I remember we used to have a top 10 in Game Informer of like sales and Wii Sports and Wii Play were always just d- destroying every month. It wasn't even like a question. Right. It would just be like, okay, what else is on this list besides Wii Sports and Wii Play? <laughs> right. And you're like, right. oh, Call of Duty. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I thought it was pretty pretty bold. Uh, Reggie uh, then ends that chapter by saying uh, that the bundling Wii Sports with the Wii was, quote, a courageous decision and the right one. Which <laughs> made me laugh like, to write that about your own decision, but I guess that's yeah. true. <laughs> um, one thing that- Reggie did fight for that he never got with the Wii was he want, always wanted that magic ninety nine dollar mm-hmm. price point, right? And uh, they were never never able to to get it down to there. Yeah, that is surprising. I think that's a big thing that kind of recurs to the book is how Nintendo like to not lose money on their hardware, where it seems like PlayStation and Microsoft are more willing to kind of take yeah. that hit for the sake of the software, but Nintendo wants to do it the way they've always done it. And I love that they even mention you know when they're debating packing in Wii Sports. That Reggie brings up like, yeah, but I know you say you don't do this, but I bought a Super Nintendo back in the day and it came with Mario World. So come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we know you'd have done this. This isn't completely unprecedented, which is which is fun. Yeah. One of the most like some of the most famous bundles of all time, like the the Nintendo with the Zapper and mm-hmm. Mario and Duck Hunt, you know, like mm-hmm. that's like probably the most well-known bundle in gaming history. Yeah, I absolutely. Uh, let's see other details you guys want to go over. Um, I really was, uh, well, I was a little bit disappointed towards the end of the book, uh, or in, in terms of from the Wii U, uh, to right before his retirement. Yeah. Um, because it felt more like I was, uh, it was like a recap. Like I was just reading a Wikipedia article mm. saying like, and then this happened and then this happened. 
And then like it, I wasn't really getting much in, in terms of like insight in uh, like how he was really feeling about a lot of the stuff. Like you mentioned, it was very glossy yeah. um, and stuff. But like that part in particular felt uh, the most glossy and the most I could probably like uh, look up the 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 sequence of events that had occurred uh, there. And like, I yeah, I really want to know like. Uh, yeah like yeah what did you what did you think about various things uh what did you think about like moving things over from the wii u to the the switch uh and and stuff like that Um, yeah yeah for sure and just yeah which games worked well porting over which ones didn't all that stuff there's so much interesting stuff that you could unpack here yeah um the um i thought it was interesting when he focused a little bit more on the nintendo culture that he experienced in kyoto how special Kyoto is known for their craftsmanship and how that comes through in a big way. And there's little details that are just fascinating uh, to yeah. try and get some glimpse inside Nintendo. Even just, you know, them being very specific and constantly refreshing even his Wi-Fi password within the headquarters. Like it felt like even that was very sensitive to have him there. Um, mm-hmm. But then stuff like how apparently it was rare for even uh, Awada to go out to dinner with employees or for there to be Nintendo company dinners in general, because like, well, everyone's mm-hmm. normally working late and they'll just order something quick so they can keep it breezy and keep on keep on working in the office anyway. Um, the little details like the fact that Iwata never moved into a bigger office when he became president of Nintendo, that idea like, oh, he preferred to stay in the small one. It's like that's that's crazy. And yeah. they talked about the hotel room situation where the old yeah. marketing oh, yeah. VP was like, I've got to be in the best room. That's got to be in my contract. And it was just a legacy thing they pulled over. <laughs> yeah. So he's like. <laughs> Mr. Awada, please take please this. Please take this and then grand piano <laughs> room, please. And he's like, "Oh no, that is part of the arrangement. I'm fine." And I'm just like, no wonder he he rightfully felt weird about taking a nicer room than Mr. Yeah. Awada. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, the the Miyamoto stuff was really interesting. Not trying to spin up drama or anything and say that they weren't close, but like he does go out of his way a thousand times to talk about his evolving friendship with Awada. And with Miyamoto, it doesn't really feel that way. I think he says at some point there's a little bit more formal of a relationship. Mm. Um, but those glimpses into Miyamoto and the fact that like in all meetings in Nintendo that Reggie witnessed at least, that Miyamoto is always like sketching drawings and writing things down in a black notebook. Mm. And Reggie's like, what are you doing there? And Miyamoto's like, I capture ideas is how he frames it. It's like, oh, just knowing there might be like an archive of Miyamoto's doodles and notes for his entire career somewhere. It's like, oh my God. The video That's game history so foundation is salivating over there. Just thinking about it. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. Like, are you guys looking forward to that pipe on the ceiling game? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, so yeah. This, this is, I think, tell, I think it's telling that like, you know, out of all the Miyamoto stories, this is the one that he kind of dives into just like telling about their relationship. But Miyamoto doesn't drink. Um, but he went out to get coffee, which was like a big surprise with Reggie. Like, Oh, he actually wants to go out and, get coffee with uh, the translator. This would be cool. So they went to this bar. um, And in that story, by the way, he says that Miyamoto understands English reasonably well, which is kind of what we all assumed. It's always confusing how much you can actually understand um, Mm -hmm. when you're interviewing him and stuff. But uh, so they went to a bar and there's a bunch of what smoking pipes on the ceiling. Is that the best way to put it? Yeah, that's what I, I think. Yeah. And apparently Miyamoto was just, obsessed like fixated on these pipes and would just not stop staring at the pipes and he kept asking reggie what's with these pipes what's going on with the pipes on the ceiling of this bar and so then reggie called the waiter over and the waiter's like yeah i don't know just everybody puts them up on the ceiling it's kind of an old thing with the restaurant and then apparently i don't know if it's reggie or miyamoto but somehow they just kept calling more they and more people yeah, yeah <laughs> till eventually, like, that's not enough info i want more. more yeah miyamoto <laughs> is uh, hungry to learn more they eventually got to like the Basically, the owner of the restaurant coming over and walking through the full history of the the pipes yeah. on the ceiling and all the fancy pipes and celebrities that have been there and donated their pipe and all that stuff. But yeah, I think he then mentions that he hopes Miyamoto turns it into a game in some way. That would be amazing. Very yeah. cute. Very cute stuff. Uh, other details that we haven't hit on yet? Ooh, there's, uh-huh. there's a few. Uh, do you guys remember eating the Bigfoot pizza that Reggie... <laughs> launched <laughs> i do not i, I did don't not really eat much uh pizza hut nobody's perfect it's fine i i don't remember it very much so i don't i can't imagine it must i mean it must have been around for a little bit for it to be considered a success long enough for him to 
make it a big deal for him to shut it down. But I just kind of Googled it because I was like, there's got to be some great commercials. Ooh, yeah. And a very young Haley Joel Osment is in the Bigfoot pizza commercial. <laughs> oh, my God. That's perfect. Wow. The tagline for it is don't eat it alone because it's just too big and too good of a value. <laughs> it will hurt you, Haley Joel Osment. That's amazing. Oh, that's yeah, I like good. the way he frames that. Like the way he spins it is that it tasted like absolute trash and that even though it's selling well it's like it's hurting our brand and i love mm-hmm. it's an interesting idea that idea that when they introduce this pizza which is made with cheaper ingredients worse ingredients worse pizza um <laughs> with the bigfoot then the overall scores for taste tests for the base pizza were lowering at pizza hut even though those right. ingredients hadn't changed people were yeah. just got the impression in their mind that like ah uh, pizza hut tastes like crap now because of the bigfoot pizza so then they had to kill it even though it was successful yeah, and like it was a turnaround from what he originally did. Like he was lobbying for, like, yeah, we should get this Bigfoot pizza, and he was like, oh wait, we should stop selling Bigfoot pizza. <laughs> right. Uh, that was yeah, that was a really cool um, moment of like, oh yeah, I'm I'm realizing a mistake, <laughs> yeah. or I'm changing something based off of new information. That was cool. This reminds me too, Hanson. Another question that yeah. I want for Reggie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In my research on the Bigfoot pizza, mm-hmm. they apparently did a Bigfoot pizza blimp no. and flew it around Manhattan, and then it crashed into an apartment building. Oh, no. <laughs> and it's what? embarrassingly draped over, like, huge fabric, just Bigfoot draped over a building. How do you and not? there's, like, fire department there. And oh, all. no. Like, he doesn't touch on that at all. <laughs> <laughs> you made a blimp. You made a blimp, man. Oh, my God. Tell us about the blimp crash, Reggie. <laughs> we need the blimp information now. Uh, oh man! I, I but th- apparently, it, it got some attention, and I think boosted got a little boosted sales a little bit just because everyone was talking about it. I'm hungry sure. for a Bigfoot pizza. Just thinking about that blimp direct over an apartment building. Um, <laughs> I was happy that towards the end he did touch on the GameStop stuff mm, quickly. Mm-hmm. It was it was pretty brief, and it was a lot of again. Uh, you can I'm I'm sensitive to anybody exposing the core of GameStop and these days, you know, I, I, sure. I'm always hungry for that. But it, you could read in between a lot of lines, but it seems like it was uh, no good. And he's done interviews where he talked about that idea about how he was on the board of GameStop and Ryan Cohen jumped in there and he brought his band of misfits from Chewy, uh, the company that he founded, or at mm-hmm. least uh, let's succeed there, the dog yeah, food company. Yeah, the, the heads there. Right, right. Um, and then... He kept offering his advice on the game industry and they were not interested in hearing from somebody like Reggie because they're more interested in their own ideas and eventually everybody left the board except for just the people from Chewy. And Reggie, I, I forget if it's in the takeaway, but at some point it's like, it's important to maintain your integrity in the business world. So it's like one of these ideas yeah. like, it really <laughs> seems like it was a shit show. Yeah, it was, um, oh man, uh, I like I I also remember like seeing one of those interviews where he was talking about that um and I could tell that in this in the book like this is probably the most direct indirect like oh yeah and we really wanted to worry about like covid restrictions and things like that uh and like make sure that our uh make sure our employees are safe like he was like looking directly at GameStop right <laughs> being like <laughs> we really wanted you to do this <laughs> right. I know that you wanted to that I know that we wanted to do this um kind of thing. Um but yeah. yeah, that was that was interesting. Also, it was uh kind of strange hearing about COVID in a book. Um oh, partly sure. because yeah, it's normally like, oh yes, books are things that uh happened long uh, long ago or something like that. <laughs> uh but then having like, yeah, the, the whole <laughs> pandemic part right uh, and being like, huh, yeah, I, I guess, guess this is now part of history. But so we're going to be hearing about this. We're at the point where we're going to hear about this in books now. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, talk about things in the past tense in books. <laughs> it's weird. Uh, yeah, I liked him talking about doing the, not, not college circuit, but giving some speeches um, at colleges and how there's room for Q&A after. And believe it or not, he tried to warn the heads of the universities that the line <laughs> for the Q&A was going to be long. And then you know what? He was even longer than expected. He was a popular wow. dude. <laughs> <He was> like, <laughs> wow, Reggie? <laughs> no way. <laughs> Reggie stayed and got selfies with everybody there that wanted one. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Two, that's, that's two hours of selfie time. <laughs> Seems sweet. Yeah. Um, not, not to be overly critical, I did think it was interesting that so much of this book was, 
about being a disruptor, disrupting things. And he was big on, you know, when hiring, you got to search for people from a broad perspective. Like he told a story early on about how proud he was for gunning for this uh, woman to get hired. And then she ended up kicking ass at, was it Procter and Gamble? I forget exactly where it was. Uh, yeah. It yeah. Was, yeah. Um, and then it was interesting, like, and then it came time to choose the new president of Nintendo of America. And I chose Doug Bowser, who also came from the sales world and also worked at Procter and Gamble. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's like the guy that's just like the closest, safest choice uh, compared to his skill set. But I don't know. Maybe he is the most talented guy there. Uh, who knows? I mean, once you get that Bowser name stuck in your head, like that's how right. do you that's take really anyone else? <laughs> yeah. You're just like, oh, but Bowser though. Yeah. No. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> Um, and then I, I know some people were kind of rubbed the wrong way from this, or maybe just one person that was talking about it in our Slack channel. But the idea that at the end of the book, he mentions that like, oh, you know, leaders, they got to take risks out there. But I think people are scared of taking risks or pushing too hard in, in the corporate world because they're scared of being canceled. The end. It is like basically yeah. the very end of the book where it's like, I don't, oh, yeah. I don't know if that's the reason people are being canceled is because they're taking Scared risks make, like, in taking business risk or yeah it's yeah, kind of weird frame they don't want bold market bold and brash marketing plans that's why people are getting canceled <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you're you're being too positive you're canceled <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was um i was because i also like read that comment in the, the slack channel and yeah. i was like expecting something to, i was like oh no i'm not gonna like reggie after this am I? <laughs> and then it was like the most it's, mad take it was just like uh using using that just to say be bold and then having nothing else to really say about it. Right. And I'm like, right. Oh, okay. Well, it, was, it, it's, it feels like it was a, uh, an add on, uh, thing where you could have just interchanged that with whatever you wanted. Uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I'm interested. He says that he's interested in the podcast space. Um, towards the end of the book he says he's working on a documentary he like lists the producer for it and stuff and I'm, mm-hmm. i don't know if that's just gonna be about his life i think that would do well i'd love to see it um so hopefully he keeps kind of keeps his interest in this kind of new media era just so we can get more stories and more insight into how nintendo works overall um in podcast interviews and you know bloomberg's interview and stuff he talked yeah about mother three everybody asking about mother three and uh, at some point he said some line where he's like, I think it's more interesting if there was a remake or kind of a reimagining of Mother or Earthbound for the future. It's like, well, yeah, sure, but just get Mother 3 out there, man. <laughs> and he says, is, he insisted that it wasn't about the content of Mother 3, which has been a, a, a hot debate, that it was a business decision. And then in that, yeah, in that Keeley thing, they talk about it too, that like they, he talked to Awada about it and it he didn't so much say it, but it seemed pretty clear that, you know, Earthbound Beginnings on the Wii U was testing the waters and it did not exactly light the world on fire, so that was mm-hmm. the end of that story, which is a real yeah, bummer. Yeah, I think his his big uh, what if was like, we never know what would have happened if you know Mr. Iwata wouldn't you know have passed away. Yeah, or if the Wii U would have been more su- the Wii U overall had been more successful. Successful, yeah. He seems to hint that like, you know, if those those two factors have gone differently, then we might have Mother Three today. So it's the, mm-hmm. it's everyone's fault for not buying a Wii U. That's right. That's right. And if only they had a super successful console right now to release it onto. But what are they going to do? Their hands are tied. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's not <laughs> even an option. Um, yeah, I, it's interesting just how much um, love Reggie gets online. I know he's kind of the, the symbol of so many Nintendo reveals and so many fond memories and stuff. But like, yeah, it's important mm-hmm. to remember he's he's a businessman, you know? Like in, yeah. in some interviews, he, he's all, he was really leaning into talking about how Nintendo needs to monetize all of its IP. He's like, you know, like Nintendo, they need kids to wake up in their Luigi pajamas and then eat some Kirby cereal and then play the Switch and then buy a Switch game and then go to the theme park and ride the Donkey Kong ride. He's like, got to monetize that IP. I feel like he's so close to being a businessman that everybody could hate, but he's so ingrained in all of our Nintendo memories. And it's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's our businessman, you know? Yeah. And it's, uh, this goes back to like me, like, read is like discovering like oh this is very much a business book yeah um uh and like yeah you definitely learn that he is a businessman um (laughs) and like the target audience is for like entrepreneurs uh or business people or finance people um and then it's for if you're interested in the gaming industry at large right like the top the top uh demographic for interest here is business and then it's when you get to the oh, and then here are some like fly on the wall uh, stories and stuff. 
Yeah. And that like that is the the most interesting thing, because I I was also thinking like at the end of this, I would be able to uh, recommend this to my brother. No problem. But my mm. brother is not at all interested in business. <laughs> so uh, I don't know whether or not he would really enjoy this. Also, he doesn't like uh, many like behind the scenes things. What? Um, what so, a monster. What's wrong like, with him? I, like, I don't understand. I want to see in front of the scenes only. <laughs> yes, I only want to see. What, I'm like, what? What? Or like, he doesn't like watching, or he's not interested in any like uh, of the no clip stuff where you huh. talk about like the development of things and stuff. Yeah. He's like, nah, I'm not interested. Which is weird. I don't understand. Like, yeah. Well, we look forward to your brother's business memoir where maybe he can exactly. shine light on exactly what's wrong with his brain for not being interested oh, in behind yes, the scenes stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I recommend reading it if you're a fan of nintendo i think there's enough detail in here and it's not not getting out there any other way so we'll take what we can get absolutely and you know this bundled with the wada asks like it's it's a cool cool double header if you're interested in nintendo books and both of them are are super breezy i mean this was like a couple sittings for for reading this thing um final thoughts brian yeah i i i think overall i enjoyed enjoyed myself with this and it's good to know more about reggie's life and you know we learn a bit of business along the way we learn have some fun about behind the scenes nintendo stuff so i i recommend it if you, if you have an interest in nintendo and if you are a fan of the reginator yeah did you ever meet reggie did you ever interview him brian Ooh. i feel like i've maybe met him i don't, don't i don't think i've done a sit down interview i think in my day, it was a lot of uh, Matthew Cotto and Matt Helgeson did a lot of the executive interviews right. every E3. But I feel like, um, I think I would have remembered if I would have done like a Wii Sports uh, face-off with Reggie, oh, yeah. which apparently he would just like, he would practice constantly in his office on <laughs> on like yeah. you know, business calls and stuff. He would be like be doing like, bowling. Ready. and you like get the hot tips from the developers tennis. on like the best way to smoke all these journalists so that when he ever has yeah. to compete with Keely or whatever. Yeah, he lost to Keely that one time and he just it couldn't like, take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not again. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think I ever met Reggie, but I was there at the um, the big like Nintendo Switch reveal thing, which was in January of 2017 in New York. Uh, and they had like a, it was kind of cool. It was a whole room where you first hands on with the Switch. Then they had different stations. Like, okay, in this station, we've simulated like an airplane and to show how you can sit in an airplane seat and play the Switch. Or in this station, it looks like this. <laughs> um, and I feel like that experience sums up this book as well, where I was so excited because we all got there and there's all the press. And then Reggie's like, hey, everybody. Um, do me a favor, turn off your recording devices. I just want to talk to you as like a human being for a bit um, before we dive into the day. And I outlined the switch and all that stuff because we have a big, exciting day. So everyone just, this is all off the record. Are we all on the same page? And we're like, yeah, yeah, cool. And I was just salivating about like, oh my God, let's hear what Reggie really has to say. And then he goes in this off the record section. Hang on, am I? <laughs> hang on. Well, I guess here's. I, there you go. If only you recorded it, you'd know what, if only you I recorded. what he said. No, <laughs> well, I was debating, like, it's a weird thing to say, but I guess the point of the story is that it's not. Because then he dove into this off-the-record section, and it was just, we're so excited to have you here today. We're really excited about the future of the Nintendo Switch. We feel like this is going to be a really unique system for Nintendo. All right, back on the record. Here we go, everybody. I was like, <laughs> what are we doing? What are we doing here, man? Stuff you don't hear anywhere else. Exactly, exactly. But what are you going to do? It's a big room full of people. He was a striking figure in those in those events because you know he's so tall and gregarious and everyone loves him so he's just kind of like just like towering over everyone and everyone's like oh reggie i love you ah. <laughs> you know just i love you <laughs> <laughs> have my children reggie <laughs> yeah yeah he i knew how to work he knew how to work the the room full of press and influencers quite well yeah for sure well hey that's uh reggie fees amaze disrupting the game look forward to the movie coming to your theater soon i don't know they, i hope they yeah. do a documentary i feel like they can do something with it um but hey thank you so much for watching or listening to this interview or not an interview this is more of a discussion i guess any help sharing it's appreciated if you enjoyed it um we're doing it for you uh charles mcgregor thank you for being here sir yeah, no problem. Uh, really happy that I, I had the opportunity to be on here and this motivated me to actually uh, check out the book. Yeah, reading's fun. Um, if you had to point people to one thing, Charles, okay. where, would you, where would you send them? Uh, I would point them, well, I guess I would point them to my Twitter, uh, okay. at DarkAceTG. 
because uh, that would be the easiest way to keep up to date with everything that I do because apparently I do too much. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Uh, Brian Ward, thank you for being here. If you had to point to one thing, what would you point to? Post my Twitter as well, Brian underscore Vor. And uh, it's always a good time talking about stuff. Uh, it's fun to do like a different type of thing with a, with reading a book. I know. <laughs> or listening to an audio book. You know. yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe we should have built this as a deepest dive, but you know what? It's too late. We'll do some book in the future for the deepest dive. Well, technically we did for the thing. So we're just kind of, yeah. we've done it before. We'll do it again, everybody. But hey, thank you so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next time. Bye. Did you know that you can more than double the amount of podcasts from MinMax every single week by supporting us at the $5 tier on Patreon? You don't have to listen through the browser or anything dumb like that. You'll get access to a private RSS feed if you support us on Patreon. You put it in your favorite podcast app, and then bam, you can listen to our weekly bonus podcast party chat, the podcast versions of The Deepest Dives, MinMax interviews, Max spoilers, and you get the MinMax show podcast a day earlier than everybody else. So please help support independent games media. Head over to patreon.com slash minmax with two ends.